Okay, we can be opening the John chapter 3, familiar verses, but I'd like to review over some of these. I think of something, uh, another fair request, if you will, one of my co-workers has a 17-year-old, I think he has a son who has some neurological issues from an accident, and he had a major seizure the other day in the hospital. Mm-hmm. She seems to have some spiritual sense about her, but I don't know if she's saved or not. But let's go to John chapter 3 and verse number 14. We'll begin. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. For God sent not his Son in the world, in the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the combination that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Amen. And I know these are, especially verse 16, familiar verses of Scripture, but sometimes we look over these and just not take them at face value, and there's yeah. always more truth in there than what we get when you just read over it. Right. Mm. In verse 14, he, Christ here is. Still in his discussion with Nicodemus, going back to verse 10, he's on this on a discourse when Nicodemus asked him how these things can be, that is how you can be born of the Spirit. But here he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Amen. He likens this under the most when Moses had lifted up the serpent, the fiery serpent of brass in the wilderness. We can turn back to Numbers and read this account. Numbers 21. The Israelites here had been wandering around the wilderness for some time now. And as they were prone to do, they were complaining. (coughs) Numbers 21, verse number 5 says... And the people spake against God and against Moses. That's a a dangerous place to be, to speak against God and God's man. Amen. It says, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathed with this light bread. Mm -hmm. They were unhappy with the provision of God. It said, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord, and against thee, praying to the Lord, that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. That was God's solution. It wasn't just to take away the, the serpents. It, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if the serpent had been any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Mm-hmm. This is in the same fashion the Son of Man must be looked at. Mm-hmm. That you know, God, theoretically speaking, could have just taken away all sin and yet yeah. it said that he must be lifted up to do whoever looketh upon him. Mm-hmm. Nope. Mm-hmm. Moses didn't just make the fiery serpent and all was better. The Israelites had to look and I'd say they had to look with faith upon the fiery serpent. Mm-hmm. Just as we have to look upon the Son of Man looking up with faith. I mean many people they know about Christ, they hear about his crucifixion, but Unless you look upon him in faith, that's not, it doesn't make a difference. Amen. So that even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. 
And here, one thing I noticed when I was reading through this is in these first two verses, he's presented as the son of man. In the next two verses, he's presented as the son of God. Mm -hmm. Christ was both, wasn't he? He was Amen. both man and God, both the sinless man and the perfect son of God. And I think we do a disservice if we don't see him both ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. But even as the son of even as the serpent was lifted up, so must the son of man be. We know he's speaking of his crucifixion here. Mm -hmm. He would be lifted up for all to see. Mm -hmm. Now some would argue that Jesus was crucified on a stake because Moses put the serpent on a pole. Well, I'm not going to argue on what shape the cross was, but history tells us that at that time there was a, a pole on the ground and they carried the crossbar and they set that up on the cross. So right. Even in that, he was fulfilled the type of being lifted up right. as a serpent. <clears throat> but it says that he was lifted up, that whosoever, verse 15, believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen. Well, this is still the message of David. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This perish means to be utterly destroyed. You don't have to turn that over to Matthew 10, 28. He says, Fear not them which kill the body, but fear him which after he kills you. <coughs> can destroy both body and soul in hell. Amen. <coughs> to perish before God is to be utterly destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't think about this perishing, it's not a that you're gonna be destroyed and come to an end, but for all eternity you'll be perishing. Right. First in hell and finally in the lake of fire. But he says he would whoever believes on the Son of Man, he said he shall not perish, but have eternal life. Does that mean that we cannot perish if we're believers? If we know Christ as Savior, but we'll have an eternal life. That's everlasting Amen. life as he describes it in verse 16. It's life that endures for all of eternity, not just for a thousand years or ten thousand years or a million years even. Amen. Well, I like I like to listen to gospel music and bluegrass gospel. Flatten Scruggs had one a million years in glory with a million more to go, but mm -hmm. even that will compare, fail in comparison to all of eternity. Amen. Well, verse 16, I know everyone knows this verse. Christians and non-Christians alike. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So here we see him presented as the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. There's a lot of debate on what this means by God so loved the world. Does it mm -hmm. mean he loves everyone? If that were the case, I don't think there would be any lost. Amen. For Christ certainly came to seek and to save that which was lost. He, yeah. He would have failed in his mission if he didn't save all that he came to die for. Right. Amen. There is no doubt other meanings to the world to multiple meanings to the word world in the scriptures of we don't have to turn there but John 17 9 says I pray not for the world but in which thou has gave us me Amen. And 1 John 2 15 says love not the world neither the things that are in the world <laughs> when any man love the world the love of the Father is not in him Amen. and we see scripture doesn't exclusively mean everyone and every individual when he says the world you know, we, some might say this is the world of the Gentiles. Some might say this is of every tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation. Some might say this is the world of the elect. There's also, the Bible speaks of the world that was being overflowed with our parish, this current evil world, and there is a world coming wherein there was righteousness. Amen. But the, whatever this meaning of the world, world is, however, we're going to take it. God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son, he says. That I don't think God could ever so love everyone and then just let them go to hell. Right. Amen. 
He is not some helpless spectator that stands up there just waiting for Johnny to make the right decision. Amen. No, he has power to cast in hell, Luke chapter 12 tells us. You're right. But no, he gave his only begotten son. He gave us Christ, Jesus, Emmanuel, the, whichever name you would like to use for him. That he, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, again, we see the same phrase that they should not perish, they should not be utterly destroyed. Mm -hmm. But oh, how we will have this life that endures for all of eternity. Amen. The message is still just a simple day believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. Amen. No need to add works or baptism or church memberships or any of these other things which man has come up with. And on the other hand, we don't need to go so far as just anyone who says, yeah, I believe in Jesus, doesn't mean they're automatically saved. You're right. Amen. There is always evidence of salvation in one's life, but that's another topic for another time. But going on to verse 17, he says... For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If Christ did not have to condemn the world. Sin had already done that. So going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Right. One man sinned, so his death passed upon all. And said that all had sinned. It was a curse of sin that passed upon all of us and all of creation. But then we were already under condemnation. Christ didn't have to condemn us when he came. Amen. In fact, if Christ had not come, we would all still be under condemnation. You're right. Even the, the Jews would not be able to really fully be delivered from sin for their sacrifices only covered them for a little while. Amen. Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. But oh, how Christ, he took away sin for us. But he didn't have to condemn us. We condemned ourselves already. Amen. Well, besides the fact that we inherited our sinful nature from Adam, we <clears throat> in and of ourselves condemn ourselves by our conduct before we were saved. Mm -hmm. You know, he said that the world through him might be saved. And Christ came primarily bring salvation to his people. As he says in Matthew chapter 2, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Mm -hmm. so I know many present the Savior from, from hell, but yet his primary goal was to save us from sin. Mm -hmm. Hell is just where we'll end up if we don't believe on him. Verse 18, he goes on to say, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is really the verse that kind of got me thinking about this area of Scripture here. Have you ever stopped and thought about he that believeth not is condemned already? Not that he will be condemned one day, or maybe when he stands before God, he'll be condemned, but currently, if it's you don't believe in Christ, you're already under the condemnation of God. Amen. Amen. This condemned means to, to be punished, to be separated, to be put asunder. To be separated from God is what this condemnation ultimately leads to. Mm -hmm. Except first in hell and then ultimately in the lake of fire for all of eternity. <clears throat> but it's not that God condemned you because of your unbelief, but your unbelief condemned yourself. Mm -hmm. Amen. He says here, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Well, I understand that God has a people, an elect people, as we would say. Mm -hmm. He has chosen some of salvation. But really, in the mind of God, it's already as good as done anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So in Romans chapter 8, he says, Let me pre born. <coughs> I should turn over there. I don't want to misquote it. Romans chapter 8. Well, 
what's sometimes referred to as the golden chain of redemption. In verse number 29, he says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be first born among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, whom he justified, then he also glorified. Amen. Now, none of us have been glorified yet. But right. In the mind of God, we're as good as glorified already. Mm -hmm. Really, all the way from eternity past, when he decreed such a thing, it was as good as done. But we see it as coming to pass over time. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing we forget about God is He is not confined by time. He is not constrained by time. He really is outside of time. Right. But we, as His creation, see things coming to pass over time. The Bible describes Christ as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But we know it was a approximately 2,000 years ago when he was literally slain in time. Mm -hmm. you know, before the foundation of the world, we were chosen in him. We were really accepted already in that point. But yet, at the time, it came to pass when we would believe and be accepted in him. But he says here that these are condemned already. So left to yourselves, you are already under condemnation. Amen. Yeah. Left to yourselves, you're as good as in hell already. But yet, God was pleased to bestow His grace upon you if you're saved. That ought to be an unwilling thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it also ought to be a, a sobering thought if you don't know Christ the Savior, that you're already under His condemnation. Mm -hmm. That the only thing really holding you from going out of eternity now is the goodness of God. That's it. You know, Mike might really think I'm crazy, but I was listening to Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God by John Edwards the other day when I was delivering mail. He had brought that point out that it's only the, the good pleasure yeah. of God that withholds the wicked from really falling into hell already. Mm -hmm. Amen. But this is very plainly brought out by Christ here that they're already under condemnation, that you know, God does not owe any of us tomorrow or the next breath even we get. Amen. By his goodness he continues to bless us and even those that deny his name. And to be in such a state that you're under condemnation already is a very perilous state to be in. Mm -hmm. Amen. Like I said, it's not you can't blame God. You can't say, well, God didn't choose me. Or, God didn't show me, or no son of man was lifted up so that all could see him. Mm -hmm. Just like in the wilderness, the serpent was lifted up so that all could see, but not all looked upon him in saving faith. You're right. Amen. I'm sure when Moses looked at that serpent, there were some saying, well, that thing's going to do no good. Mm -hmm. Just as some today say, well, at least in effect, well, Christ is no good. Hmm. Well, they, Brother Larry brought this out on Wednesday about they trodden underfoot the blood of Christ. Really, that's what they do when they say such a thing, when they deny that Christ is sufficient. That's right. <coughs> no. You're under condemnation because you have not believed in Christ. Mm hmm. Not because of anything God has done or God hasn't done, but That's right. because of what you haven't done. You haven't believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. That He, for lack of a better way of saying, He has been presented to everyone, mm -hmm. but not everyone is going to believe. Mm -hmm. And that will be <coughs> what condemns you. But certainly, Things such as adultery and fornication and uncleanness and idolatry and sodomy and drunkenness and the list goes on and on. All those things are wicked before God, but ultimately what condemns you is your unbelief in Christ. Amen. The most wicked of men, the most moral of men, if they have not believed in Christ, that is what will condemn them. Amen. Even if you're here today and don't know Christ as Savior, that's what will condemn you. Mm-hmm. 
you know how you ought to cry out to God for his everlasting to leave. You know what? I'm not going to tell you to repeat a prayer after me or to just simply give your heart to Jesus. The scripture doesn't say anything about that or accepting Jesus or making a decision for Jesus. But the only thing you can do is, I think what Larry Jesus prays before, to stow yourself on the mercy of God. Amen. That it's only him and his good pleasure that can save you. Verse 19, he explains this condemnation further. He says, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Mm -hmm. They choose evil or darkness, as it's called here, because that is their nature. Because that is what their flesh is bent towards. Mm -hmm. It's not because God turned them aside. They were already turned aside. Mm -hmm. Every last one of us would have continue to choose darkness over light if God had not been pleased to intervene. Mm -hmm. Light has come to the world, that is Christ. He was the light of man, he is the light of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, light has come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Mm -hmm. The natural man does not choose Christ, and that man does, has no desire to choose Christ, because he says, because his, their deeds are evil. Amen. Because the flesh has no desire to be delivered from sin, and the flesh has no desire to be delivered from his wicked ways. And yet, so many today think that they're going to do enough good works to outweigh their bad works. Mm -hmm. Right. And, oh, as Brother Larry mentioned in the introduction, we have we, it'll only be on the merit of Christ. When we stand before God, it won't be good works outweighing bad works. It won't be baptisms. It won't be who your parents are or what church you went to. Amen. Because left to yourself, you'll always choose darkness over light. Left to yourself, you'll always choose wickedness over good or sin over that which is righteous. Amen. Because naturally, our deeds are evil. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and read the next few verses and we'll close. It says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So Peter Christ again says, They will not come to him. They will not give up that darkness and come to the light because they don't want their deeds to be reproved. They don't want their deeds to be made known. They don't want their deeds to be condemned. Mm -hmm. But he that doeth trust do it true, come unto the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Mm -hmm. It must be God that brought these new works in us, that brings these works to pass. No, no man can come, come to God except the Father which has sent me draw him. Amen. Amen. Chapter 6. So we could get into lots of debates about election and effectual call and I believe all those things. But ultimately, it's your personal responsibility to believe on Christ. Amen. And you cannot blame God and His sovereignty for your lack of doing so. When you're under condemnation already, and except you repent and believe on Christ, then you will spend eternity separate and apart from Him. Amen. Said first in the hell and in the lake of fire, but oh. If you believe, you should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. So we ought to thank God for that everlasting life, that eternal life, that no matter how much we may mess up, no matter how much we may fail Him, yet we shall not perish. Hmm. So again, it's not based on what we do, but it's what Christ has done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe we ought to serve him. I believe we ought to bear good fruit, bear, do good works. None of those things in and of themselves will save you. It's simply Christ and his finished work on Calvary. Amen. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's still the gospel today. But if you don't believe, it will be your own fault that you don't believe. Amen. It will be your own fault that you're in hell. 
Well, you'll have all eternity to think about that. Mm -hmm. Although over and over again the gospel was presented to you and yet you didn't believe, mm -hmm. it will really a hard thought to even think that it will be your own fault. Mm -hmm. and yet there are some even in this room today that continue to reject the message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall we say Right. Oh, well, let's thank, thanks be to God if you are saved. Amen. We owe him a debt that we still cannot pay. You're right. Now we can give him thanks for all eternity and praise and worship him for all eternity and it will still not be enough for That's right. how that Christ died for us or how we sang earlier, how that Jesus paid it all. Amen. Not paid the most or we know we paid every last debt that we owed. Thanks be to God for that. Let's close with that thought. Amen.